Hi guys. <coughs> 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 Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you are new here, <coughs> don't mind me coughing into my robe. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. And put on my makeup at the same time. Not today though. So if that sounds fun to you, you are in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. You might notice my voice is a little Mm, not the best. Okay, I got sick. I sounded like one of Marge Simpson's sisters for a couple days. Okay, so I've been putting this off. Oh my god, what? I already have makeup on from the day and it's been a long day and I don't feel like starting all the way over so we're just gonna take it off instead of putting it on. Haha, <laughs> reverse. Switching it up, keeping things interesting. I've seen my girl Brittany Vaughn do this before and it was a delight. So thank you for the inspo, Brittany. So we're continuing the terrible tour of the United States where I just find a terrible story in each one of the states. <laughs> this one takes us to the home of more ghost towns than any other state. It's also home to a quarter of the country's entire population of llamas. <laughs> we're talking about the beaver state. This is Oregon. This is the story of Ward Weaver. On January 9th, 2001, 12-year-old Ashley Pond was getting ready for school in Oregon City, Oregon. Oh. <laughs> Ashley had a big personality. You know, she was loud and outgoing, somebody who wanted to make friends with everyone. And although she had had, had had, a rocky relationship with her mom in the past, things were definitely much better. She was part of the dance team and they met after school to practice. They had an upcoming performance. Now, Ashley wasn't exactly an early bird, so she was running late for school that day. Surprise. She would sometimes get a ride to school from her friend's dad, her friend Mallory. And the dad's name was Ward Weaver. He lived right across the street from the bus stop and right outside of the Newell Creek Village apartment complex where she lived. Ashley rushed out the door that morning with a quick, goodbye, love you. Ashley's mom, Lori Pond, was expecting her home at 6.15 p.m. that day after dance practice. But when that time came and went, Lori immediately called the school. She spoke to the dance coach and found out that Ashley had not only missed dance practice at school, but she didn't come to school at all that day. So Lori called the Clackamas County Police to report her daughter missing. When the police came, she showed them that all of Ashley's clothing and her most treasured items were still there, so it's not like she had packed up and ran away. Ashley Marie Pond was born on March 1st, 1989 in Oregon City, Oregon to Lori Davis and David Pond. Lori was a young mom and eventually actually had three more children. Lori and David were married, but it didn't work out. You know, in 1988, they divorced. And while that was going on, things at home weren't great. So during the divorce proceedings, specifically the child custody arrangements, David requested a paternity test. So that was when Ashley found out that her dad was not her dad. It was actually a man named Wesley Rotger Jr. Well, Ashley started having visits with her biological dad, Wesley, and pretty soon after that, her family noticed that she started acting different. She seemed to be like angry all the time, and then eventually she started trying to get out of the visits altogether. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in any of the stuff that I'm using, I'm gonna link it all in the description box for you. Okay, so Ashley has started these visits with this man that she's found out is her father and has started acting different. You are putting it together. Um, it wasn't good. In fact, Wesley was actually sexually assaulting her. Well, Ashley told her mom and he was arrested and charged with 40 criminal counts. The end. End of the story. I'm just kidding. We're just getting started. Okay, so Ashley's parents are divorced. Her bio dad turns out to be like a straight up pervert. And things at home weren't amazing. 
You know, there were allegations that Lori was drinking a lot and actually on one instance locked the kids out of the car or not the car, the apartment. The police were called to their apartment several times, but no charges were ever filed. By this time, um, you know, Lori was seeing a new guy and Ashley did not like him at all. So she started spending more time at her friend's house, Mallory's house, Mallory Weaver. And I'm just gonna do full skincare, man. I'm even gonna shave my little chinny chin chin. <laughs> okay, so according to the teens in the area, the Weaver house was like a cool place to hang out. So one of Ashley's close friends would later say that Ashley even looked up to Mr. Weaver, kind of as like a father figure. I mean, it kind of makes sense because, you know, it's her good friend's dad and she spent a lot of time over there while things at her own house were like maybe not so nice. My little mustache. <laughs> so Ashley actually spent a fair amount of time at the Weavers and some of the research even says that she lived with them for a time. She would go with them on family vacations. You know, it was all very good. Ward, by all accounts, was a really great dad. He was even known to bring Mallory dinner to dance practice if it was running a little bit late and he would always bring extra for all her friends and teammates. But some people also say that he kind of seemed a little like weirdly overprotective, you know what I mean? Like he wouldn't let Mallory wear makeup at all. You know, maybe not super unusual for that age, but that's kind of the age where young girls are starting to wear makeup and experiment, have fun. Anyways, so it's all good, right? Wrong. On September 4th, Ashley confided to her reading teacher that Ward Weaver attempted to rape her. She said that she understood what rape was, she knew what it meant, and this wasn't quite it. She told the teacher, quote, When I spend the night there, he usually just lays on top of me. <sighs> well, the teacher let her parents know right away, and they reported Ward Weaver to the police. Ashley even went to the police station for an interview where she verified what the teacher said was true. Okay, so back to Ashley's pedo dad, Wesley. While Wesley was in jail awaiting trial, he found out that Ashley accused Ward Weaver of similar crimes. And this was good for him because, you know, now there's a pattern that his attorneys can attack. According to him, that Ashley is like crying out and like doing this for attention, making false accusations. So with Wesley and Ward's attorneys in cahoots, Ward testified on Wesley's behalf. Ward, the accused molester, testified on behalf of another accused molester. He said that... Ashley has this habit, if she gets in trouble by someone, she'll make accusations against that person. Um, and the first time that I actually had to come down on her about her mouth, um, she did just that. You know, she made accusations that I had molested her. Well, Wesley was able to enter into a plea deal, one count of unlawful sexual penetration, and was sentenced to 180 hours of probation. What the fuck is unlawful sexual penetration of a 12-year-old? Oh, rape. That's what I thought. Also, nothing was done with those allegations against Ward Weaver, but we'll come back to that. Ashley never came home from school and actually didn't go to school. She left for school and never came back. The local police searched the entire apartment complex, including the crawl spaces, you know, and they reached out to local media to try to get Ashley's picture out to as many people as they could. They also called the FBI, who sent out a CARD team, C-A-R-D, that stands for Child Abduction Rapid Deployment. They have these like highly specialized teams that include investigators, forensic specialists, and even victim advocates who've been working, you know, with these kinds of crimes against children. These CARD teams are all over the United States and they have like a 90% success rate in identifying and apprehending child abductors. But in this case, there were so many suspects that they had to clear them one by one. As the weeks wore on and there were no sightings of Ashley, her family started to wonder if she would ever be found. Lori Pond started escorting her three younger children personally to the bus stop and staying there until she watched them get on the bus. 
the media was out in droves, and they were interviewing anybody who knew Ashley, including close friends and fellow dance team members like Miranda Gaddis. A local reporter, Anna Canzano, covered this case from the start, and there's actually footage of her at the bus stop one morning talking to the kids. Miranda said that Ashley had been gone at that point, like, too long, and, you know, maybe she had been abducted. It's really hard to believe that having one of your friends or something, it's just really different and really sad. The next time we hear the name Miranda Gaddis, it's because she, too, has vanished. On March 9th, 2001, like three months after Ashley disappeared, Miranda Gaddis, her dance teammate, was getting ready for school. Her mom normally left for work early, you know, like 7.30, and it was normally expected for Miranda to get herself on the bus like she did every day. Miranda also lived in the Newell Creek Village Apartments, so she rode the same bus that Ashley did. So most mornings, Miranda would go to the Weavers to wait for the bus with Mallory, but that morning, Mallory wasn't there. We now know that the night before, Ward had taken Mallory to her mom's house to spend the night, although the mom said that this was not a scheduled visit and Mallory wasn't supposed to spend the night, but Ward insisted. At 1.15 that day, Michelle Duffy, Miranda's mom, got a call from her older daughter saying that Miranda wasn't at school and she had not gotten off the bus. Well, Michelle immediately called the police. Now, listen, the, like, the vibe in this town was wild. You know, people thought there was a serial killer on the loose or something. Ashley's disappearance was still very fresh in the minds of families living there, especially at the apartment complex, and Miranda's mom was frantic. So the police came out again, the FBI was called again, and the media, by this point, I think had never even left. So Miranda Diane Gaddis was born on November 18th, 1988 in Oregon City, Oregon, to Michelle Duffy and Jason Gaddis. Miranda was described as a spunky girl. You know, she had a pierced belly button, she loved to dance and wear glitter makeup, and she had recently lost a ton of weight after joining the dance team. When Miranda was six years old, her father was arrested and charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting two young girls and was sentenced to six months in prison. Because of this crime, her parents divorced. And after the marriage ended, her mother started dating Brett Edward McEnany, who was not a good guy either. He sexually abused Miranda and her two sisters. And because of this, she ended up spending 18 months in foster care. So these girls had more in common than most people knew. Aside from attending Gardner Middle School and being on the same dance team, both of them lived with their moms in the Newell Creek Village apartment complex. Both were friends with Mallory Ward and both had been sexually abused by men that their mothers had brought into their lives. With two girls officially missing, the community was more than just alarmed. Parents of young girls started moving out of the area. Law enforcement put up billboards with both of these girls' faces, and they offered a $50,000 reward. The girls were also featured on an episode of America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. It was actually the very last episode of the original series hosted by Robert Stack. Investigators used helicopters to search from the air, and they used canines on the ground. One of those dogs actually alerted in an area near Ward Weaver's backyard, and investigators were definitely looking at him, squinting, if you will. But they didn't have any legal grounds to search his property. Now, early on after Ashley Pond went missing, investigators did interview Ward Weaver, and he'd given them a tour of the house. He said he didn't have anything at all to hide, and in fact, he even submitted to a lie detector test. In this case, actually many people submitted to lie detector tests that were not successful <laughs> at all. A lot of people failed these tests, and they, they blamed it on the person that was administering the test, questioning their qualifications. As all this continued, many people really started to squint at Ward Weaver, you know. They believed that he was involved, that he was the number one suspect, but also, you know, his house was right there at the bus stop. The girls were all friends with each other. They'd all spent time at his house. So Ward Weaver actually granted an interview, like an on-air interview with KATU News, 
They did an in-depth special where Anna Canzano and the film crew came to his home. The, the shit is wild, you guys. They want to put me on their list of suspects, fine. You know, I live right here in the middle of all this mess. But Weaver takes that statement August. a step further okay, and claims investigators are calling him their September. main suspect. That is what the FBI and the Oregon City Police are going around telling my family and my friends when they're questioning them about me. You know, she asked him what you'd expect to hear. You know, do you have any involvement? Do you know anything? And he absolutely denied anything, any wrongdoing, right? He did say that he knew that Ashley had a troubled home life and, you know, she was probably better off wherever she is. Weaver tells um, me Ashley Pond was, lived at his home yeah, the previous still, summer. Yeah, he happened? says her mother didn't want Ashley anymore and wanted him to keep her. That's kind of a weird thing to say about a 12-year-old child that you used to, like, keep in your home that you were close to, that you had almost like a, a father-ish type of relationship. Isn't that weird? During the interview, they're just sort of like walking along through the house, through the kitchen. I notice on the microwave a recent issue of People magazine featuring Ashley and Miranda on the cover. Through the backyard, past this, you know, section of fresh concrete that he poured three days after Ashley went missing. And when he was asked about this new addition, this concrete area, Ward, he kind of got defensive, but he's like, I'm putting in a jacuzzi. Last time I checked, that's not against the law. Well, one of Ward's friends was later interviewed and verified that he was indeed installing a jacuzzi. They had gone uh, looking to buy one from a person selling theirs and they noticed how the concrete pad that it was sitting on was cracked. So they were talking about putting steel reinforcement in the ground using some old barrels that he had before pouring the concrete. Barrels. Barrels. In some later interviews, Ward's, uh, one of Ward's sons said that he had helped his dad in the backyard of that little project, digging the holes and all that. But once it was time to finish things up, Ward said that he didn't need any help and he did the rest alone. Did Ward have an alibi for both of the times that these young girls went missing? I was here, but uh, time frame doesn't make anything feasible. He said that he got to work on time the day that Ashley went missing and that left no time for him to harm somebody. We now know that that wasn't true. The police verified that he was actually late for work that day, getting there at 9.30 instead of 9 o'clock. When he was asked about this, he said that his alarm, meaning his daughter, who woke him every day, had malfunctioned that day. Try to say that he slept late. Then he later said that he had problems with his burglar alarm. There was not a burglar alarm on this dump. I'm just saying. On the day that Miranda went missing, he initially said that he was taking care of his sick daughter, who, again, wasn't home. I mean, even with all these inconsistencies and his failing the polygraph test, the police still didn't have enough. No probable cause to search his home or his property. Now. Now, I have questions, okay? So, the guy's alibi is being at home, his house, at the bus stop, where the girls disappeared from. And he also has a history of being accused of raping one of them. Over the next couple of months, the heat started to turn up on Ward Weaver, and then he started complaining to friends about being targeted, and he said that he thought his phone was tapped. He also started talking about moving out of town. Eighth. Ward Weaver says he is fed up with investigators hassling him and now plans to move out of state, perhaps to Mexico. I'm going to go check you know, a couple places out and see what's got the best chances for jobs, and I'm out of here. Meanwhile, Ward Weaver's older teenage son, Francis, and his 19-year-old girlfriend moved in. On August 13th, 2001, Ward picked up the girlfriend from work and brought her back to the house. She later said that the minute that they walked into the house and realized that they were alone, Ward's demeanor completely changed and he straight up attacked her. Gone was the nice family man who had always been kind to her. He grabbed her, dragged her into Mallory's room and ripped her clothes off. While he sexually assaulted her, he choked her so hard that she almost passed out. She said at one point he put his hand over her mouth and nose and she truly thought he was gonna kill her. When he was done, he got up, he collected himself, and she ran her nearly naked ass right out of the house. 
She grabbed a blue tarp from the yard to cover herself and she went out to the road and like flagged down traffic and somebody drove her to the nearest store for help. It was a Payless, um, Payless shoe source. So the crew members helped her, of course, you know, they brought her inside, they let her use the phone, they let her sit in the back room, gave her a sweater to wear, you know, while waiting for help to arrive. Um, she had actually called her boyfriend, Francis, who immediately came to the store. And Francis also called the police to let them know that his dad had raped his girlfriend. And by the way, his dad had recently confessed to him that he was the one who killed Ashley and Miranda. Now I keep calling the girlfriend girlfriend, but it's because her name was not ever published. So, okay. So the police immediately go to Ward Weaver's house and arrest him for the sexual assault of the girlfriend. So when police interviewed Francis, um, he told them about a few days earlier, Ward had been talking about needing to move away. And he told him that he killed Ashley because she talked. This referred to his assault on her, remember? Francis wasn't sure that he believed anything that he was saying, so he just sort of kept it under his hat. I mean, it turns out that Ward Weaver definitely had a motive to kill Miranda. So apparently at Mallory's birthday party a few weeks before, Miranda was there with other girls from the dance team. Weaver got upset at that party because Miranda had advised another teenage girl not to spend the night telling her Ward Weaver had molested Ashley and she might get molested too. Ward, as well as other parents, overheard this conversation. So now with Ward under arrest for sexual assault, police now had probable cause to search his home and yard. And they pretty much immediately found way more than they bargained for. That reporter, um, Anna Canzano, she was actually on the scene when the medical examiner's truck arrived and it's just so sad. She realizes like right there live on the air that it wasn't good. You know, I've been covering this case for several months now and um, No, right now they're in the process of backing it in. They have pulled up the side of the tent. Right in the backyard in one of the outbuildings, like a shed, there was a box um, like for a microwave. And also in that shed was like about a hundred fly strips hanging from the ceiling, all covered in flies. What was in the box, you ask? Uh, what's in the box? Not you give me the what's gun. in the fucking box? Yeah. You know what was in there. It was Miranda Gaddis's badly decomposed body. The police spent the next two days digging up that cement slab poured for the jacuzzi. And eventually they found a blue steel barrel. Now we know that finding a barrel is never a good sign, but inside the barrel was another body, Ashley Pond. When the medical examiner inspected the bodies, they were in such bad condition that they weren't able to determine the actual cause of death for either of them. They also said that Miranda had been kept somewhere in extreme cold until wrapped in plastic and put in that box. We can all guess that when Ward Weaver had that TV film crew in his kitchen and they walked right past that freezer, she had probably been kept in there. Ward's in jail, but that didn't keep him from talking to anybody who would listen. He loved talking. So he actually granted another interview to KATU where he said that he didn't bury Ashley. So if you didn't kill Ashley and Miranda, then how did they wind up in your backyard? Public property. Who knows? That place has been public access since those apartments and those condos have been built. He wasn't sure how deep they'd found her, you know, but his yard was public, you know, easily accessible and somebody else must have put her there. Sure, Jan. And as for the freezer, he tried to say that they owed him to replace it. They better pay him for it. He was sure that he would be exonerated. Now, as I have said before in other cases, I don't really get super wrapped up in figuring out why a person does terrible things, but this guy, Ward Weaver, comes from a long line of shitheads. So Ward Weaver was born on April 6th, 1963 in Humboldt County, California to Trish and Ward Weaver Jr. So Ward Weaver in this case is Ward Weaver three. All right, so in 1967, Ward 
the third's father, Ward Jr., abandoned the family. And Trish actually uh, remarried a longshoreman named Bud Boudreaux. Now, Bud was an abusive alcoholic who liked to spend a lot of time in bars. You know, he would get drunk and fight. And he also kept several open tabs open at several different bars in the area. Now, Trish would actually work overtime as a waitress to pay the tabs on these accounts, and the family struggled financially. Now, because Bud spent so much time in bars, Trish would make a bed in the back seat of the car for Ward and his two sisters while she drove around all night going from bar to bar trying to find him. Can you believe this? So even on those nights that she would do that, the kids would actually be happy because it means that Bud wasn't home to beat them. Bud eventually found work in North Bend, Oregon, so they moved, and Trish and Bud ended up having a child of their own, a son that they named Robert. What could go wrong? In 1975, Bud took Ward with him on a work trip to Sacramento, and a few weeks later, a co-worker of Bud's called Trish to let her know that Bud was leaving Ward alone for hours in the hotel room while he was out at the bar. Well, Trish demanded that Bud bring Ward home, and he did, but she believes that something happened on that trip because the Ward that returned home was not the one that went out, you know? He was never the same. Um, shortly after that, the family moved again, this time to Portland, Oregon. Ward's siblings said that Ward was extremely abusive with them, violent. You know, he especially targeted that youngest brother, Robert. He once put Robert in front of a tree in the backyard and he used a dog chain, you know, to wrap around him to hold him there. And he would just leave him there tied to that tree. And he would also, this is terrible. This is terrible. He would hold little Robert's face at the fence while the neighbor's dog was like snapping and snarling like so close just to scare him while he laughed. Isn't that awful? I hope that kid's okay. Jeez. Okay, so you get it. Ward is violent, abusive, just like mental. So in April of 1981, a relative accused the now 18-year-old Ward of sexually assaulting her, but the authorities chose to not press charges because Ward had already enlisted in the United States Navy Reserve and was about to ship out. What a great plan. Why was that a thing back in the day? Like, you can either join the military or you can go to prison. Like, how, how are those... Okay, well, at the same time, Ward's actual father, the one who ran out, Ward Jr., well, he was in trouble with the law. On February 5th, 1981, around the same time, uh, Robert Radford and Barbara Lavoy were on a road trip headed to Las Vegas when their car broke down, and Ward Jr. was a truck driver, so he offered them a ride to the next town, and long story short, he assaulted, kidnapped, and murdered them both. Buried them in his backyard under <clears throat> cement slabs. Well, when he was prosecuted for those two murders, he tried to make a deal with the prosecutor. You know, he said that if they took the death penalty off the table, he would lead them to the bodies of 26 more victims. <coughs> well, they didn't believe him, so they turned down his offer and he was sentenced to death. Ward is in the Navy. He met a woman named Maria Stout. Um, he was only in the Navy for like a little over a year before he got kicked out for too much drinking. Sailors drinking alcohol. Imagine. So he's out of the Navy. He moves back to Portland with Maria. Their marriage was garbage, as you can imagine. Um, he used to beat the shit out of her. They ended up having two sons and a daughter before Maria came to her senses and got the fuck away from him. Also, Ward did some time for assaulting their babysitter by striking her with a block of cement. Okay, that's enough of this mask. By 1993, Ward was selling cocaine and meth. By this time, he was age 31, and he had started dating an 18-year-old woman named Christy Sloan. At one point, um, he attacked her and hit her about the head with a cast iron skillet. Apparently she was asleep. You know, he's lucky he didn't kill her, but the charges were actually dropped because Christy refused to testify. And she later said it was because she was so terrified of Ward and there was no way that she was going to testify against him. I'm really kind of like 
shortening and sanitizing these backgrounds. There's a lot of details. These were the terrible people, terrible people, the, the weavers. Anyways, in 1997, he moved to that home on Beaver Creek Road, that one there by the school bus stop right outside the apartment complex. This is where he would meet Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis, both through his daughter, Mallory. Because of the Weaver men's violent tendencies, it's led people to point to the murder gene. You know, it's hard to argue with that considering all of the Weaver men had hurt everyone they came in contact with. You know, well, violence didn't start with Ward Weaver III or even Ward Jr. It started with Ward. He, according to this research, would sexually assault his wife, Dorothy, and then on nights where she refused to lay with him, he would find other women to bring home and then he would assault them in front of her. Well, now we're back to the present, Pre present a part of this story. You know, 39-year-old Ward Weaver the third. He's in jail, there's been two bodies of young girls discovered at his home, and there's like an avalanche of associated charges raining down on him. Aggravated murder, abuse in all different degrees, rape, attempted rape, sexual abuse in all different degrees, abuse of a corpse, 16 counts in all. Well, Ward pled guilty to the murders of Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis and he pled no contest to the rest. And in case you don't recall, because we have covered this before, no contest is a way of saying, I'm not gonna say I did it, but the state definitely has a, enough evidence to put me away, so. Well, Ward only agreed to plead guilty to those two charges in exchange for escaping the death penalty. But he did receive two life sentences with no possibility of parole. Well, two years later, Mariah Pond, Ashley's older sister, she started visiting Ward Weaver in prison. She said that she wanted to understand, you know, what happened and why. In this visit, this is incredible, Ward Weaver admitted to killing the girls with his bare hands. And he said that if he hadn't been caught, she would have been next. Ward Weaver s said in various different ways that Ashley deserved it and he didn't feel bad about it at all. This is the girl who admitted to her teacher that he tried to rape her. Apparently he was moving her body or something and Miranda saw too much. So she was a witness and he took her out. So a few years after this conviction, on February 14th, 2014, Ward Weaver's older son, Francis, uh, was arrested. So he and several friends had murdered a drug dealer that they knew, apparently, and that's a whole separate story, whole separate case, a whole separate set of shenanigans, but I guess the shitty apple doesn't fall far from the shitty apple tree. <laughs> that is the story of Ward Weaver. <coughs> I think I have put everything I can possibly put on my face and my skin feels delicious. <laughs> Again, if you want to see whatever it is that I was using today, just check down in the description box because everything that's available will be linked. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then make sure you subscribe to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials as well. If you have a story that you would like to recommend, just check down in the description box because there is a Google Doc. Fill it out, give me all the juicy details. I would love to hear from you. We are almost done with our terrible tour of the United States. I can't believe it, but once we do that, I don't, I don't have a plan. So keep them coming, keep them coming. Um, okay, I'm gonna drink a big glass of water, I think, and go to bed. I am tired, so. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! It's not COVID. I took a test. It's very juicy sounding. Gross. And on it. And they have a 90% success. Okay, so. <coughs> to Mr. Stop texting me. So that may. <laughs> <coughs> Later say, stop texting me.